it's uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here in Brazil. This is my my second time. I had a wonderful time, uh, despite a, a rocky start, which you'll hear about. But uh, I enjoyed all the talks, and uh, let's get started. So I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a hard to see what I'm actually talking about just in the title called Custodial Dark Pions should become clear through the talk, I hope. Uh, based on a couple of papers here done with some collaborators of mine who are all, or used to be, most of them at Oregon. So I'm just going to jump right in. I, I really like this Iron Man thing I've been saying, so now I, glad, I like to be doing it. Get to make the joke, finally. All right, so I'm going to be working a uh, whole setup throughout this is in a composite dark sector, sort of, sort of different than most of the talks we hear about. We heard some composite this in, in Alfonso's talk, but I'm going to be talking about this new dark, that's the dark in my title, sector. Basically, I'm going to imagine that there's a bunch of matter, and I have a new confining force, not RQCD, just another SUN gauge group. So I'm going to stick in stuff, matter, that's charged under this gauge group, not our color. It's going to be completely inert under our color. But I want to say that perhaps some of this stuff has got electroweak charges. This is a super general framework, just some new color, but we still have communication with this sector through these electroweak stuff. And because I'm going to imagine this gauge theory, SUNT, is confining, it's going to make bound states of these things. So there's going to be dark mesons, dark pions, dark rows, dark baryons, etc. This is a super general framework, lots of BSM frameworks that you can cram into here. The one important parameter is where this gauge group becomes strong. You can move this all around, but what I'm going to focus on is this thing is essentially at the TEV scale. And while you could come up with composite scenarios that are trying to explain the hierarchy, make the Higgs as a composite, that's not my goal here. I'm not a composite Higgs at all. So I'm going to imagine that there is a fundamental Higgs doublet in addition to this stuff. So since we're at a dark sector, this is sort of a general framework to begin with, but since we're at a dark sector's workshop, I'll talk about the sort of dark model, dark matter motivation for it not only because we're at this workshop, but it also sort of ex historically explains why I'm interested in this subject, is that if I have one of these composite, new composite sectors, we have a great candidate automatically for dark matter, just the dark baryon. Just like our normal baryon, the lightest baryon is QCD is stable because of an accidental U1 baryon number. If I imagine this new sector, the lightest dark baryon, it's also going to be stable for the same reason. I don't need to add in a, a Z2 symmetry. And I say natural because this new confining sector gets its mass from dimensional transmutation. There's no need for new Higgses or anything like that. So just saying stable doesn't mean you're a good dark matter candidate, especially because I want it to be made up of stuff that carries electroweak charges. But it is possible, as sort of people worked out ages ago, that even if the constituents, the underlying fermions, carry electroweak charges, that I can arrange for the overall baryon to be electric and electroweakly neutral. This isn't obvious. These guys had to work out. There's some group theory that goes in here. But they've shown that this is possible. So I've got baryon that's neutral, but the stuff inside of it carries electroweak quantum numbers. That means there's not going to be any you know, Zs or photons talking to our dark matter, the dark baryon but I can still write down higher dimensional operators between those baryons and us. Uh, yes? Maybe you say that and I miss it, but the, these fundamental fermions, the psi, L, and psi R, do you have mass terms for them? We'll get to that in a second. Yes, very good question. So here's just like a goofy picture. We can imagine this blue blob is the baryon. It's neutral because it's got equal amounts of charge plus a half minus. In this picture, you could imagine a whole variety of different QCD dynamics, or strong, dark color dynamics. But I'm going to sort of assume a very QCD-like spectrum. So the guy I care about, or we care about for dark matter, is this lightest baryon. There could be other excited baryons there. And there's also going to be a whole bunch of lighter states. We're going to have some chiral symmetry from those dark fermions. It's going to break. It's going to make dark pions, dark rows, etc. I say dark here, the asterisk is dark refers to that they have a new dark confining group. Only this guy is what I require to be electric and electroweakly neutral. These other lighter states could carry standard model charges, and in general, they will. 
This is the guy who's stable by U1 baryon number. These guys in general, as I'll talk about, will decay. So this is the picture to have in your head. Yeah, ask Yang. Yes, you enforce essentially G parity, and then the dark pion is stable. Uh, abundance, abundance, these are strongly interacting models, so it's kind of a squishy thing. It's hard to pin down. It could be symmetric, sort of thermal, just baryon, anti-baryon, annihilating to a bunch of pions. That's one way. Or it could just be asymmetric, like our proton. And like I said, there's a lot of sort of ability to maneuver here within scales. But uh, the people who've looked at it from the previous slide, usually this puts this dark baryon, dark matter, in the 1 to 100 TeV-ish category. So that's why I said in the last slide it's heavy, heavy dark matter. All right, this is the picture. I'm not going to say much more about this. We're just going to assume through one of these mechanisms we can get the right abundance. How do you see it? This depends crucially on whether you have an even or odd number of colors. Remember, I can't write down renormalizable operators with this dark matter because it's neutral, electroweak neutral. So it's higher dimensional stuff. If number of colors, dark colors always, is odd, dark matter, the dark baryon, the fermion. Therefore, it's going to communicate the lowest higher dimensional operator I can write down is magnetic moment. And just our good old photon there, because the constituents there, just like the neutron has a magnetic moment, this dark neutron, if you want, does too. So I can draw this. Uh, just if I scale up the neutron and call this guy a neutron but heavier, and I plug and chug and say if this is dark matter, direct detection rules this out to about 20 TeV. Now, it's still possible dark matter could be heavier than that and would be okay, which is a cool possibility, but I want to sort of focus on the next step. For this, this is just taking, ex it, basically this is one over the mass of the baryon, and then you know there's some number that goes in front of here, and for these calculations, they just sort of assume it's the same as the neutron. They actually do this stuff on the lattice so that they can change some of the color properties. But yeah, this was a lattice calculation that spits out this number. That's almost the right Yeah, absolutely, right? So it is assuming sort of QCD-like because you're using that as a model. Uh, okay. That's where we're at if it's a fermion. If, on the other hand, ND is even, then the dark baryon is a boson. I can't write down this term. The most important interactions then come from the electric polarizability or electromagnetic polarizability, something like this. Higher dimensional operator, and if I want to stitch it to a nucleus to do scattering, it's a loop process. So this guy, much smaller than this one. So this is sort of uh, where I want to focus for a second. If you want to go ahead and say, how would you detect this now so-called stealthy dark matter, because it only interacts with this much higher dimensional operator, uh, you can go ahead and calculate what's its cross-section off of nuclei. This is not an easy thing to do with pen and paper, because we're talking about a strongly interacting theory. kind of goes to Francesco's question. Uh, so this was done by this lattice corporation, or corporation, collaboration, the most psychedelic uh, collaboration, the LSD collaboration. They calculated this, and that's what this purple band is there. And the width there is some nuclear physics uncertainties. So this is a cross-section you get by a calculation. These blue lines are telling you what experiments are ruling out. That's the stuff above. What do you get from this plot? Well, we've got a region here where this sort of dark matter, stealthy, talks through electropolarizability, is still allowed not only allowed, but it could be seen by direct detection. Right? So that's cool. But we see this thing as a very steeply falling function because of that operator. So the question that motivated all of this and why the title says me bari or, um, mesons and not baryons is because what happens if the dark baryon is this type of object, but its mass is 5 TeV? So it's sitting there on this direct detection plot way down here, buried in the neutrino floor. You would never see this in direct detection, just because it would be on this line, but extrapolated way down here. So I guess my circle's bad. So what do you do? How would you tell if this is what's going on? This is one circumstance where the best chance to detect this idea is actually through the LHC. Now, I'm not proposing we're going to make five TV states. That doesn't make sense. But remember our ladder, our spectrum. 
So if the dark baryon is here, the dark mesons could be hanging out down here. So that's our target. Seeing the dark mesons of the LHC is one of the few signatures that this kind of setup would have. This is, uh, I have no idea. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, this should be way down here. Yeah. I'll have to tell these guys their plot is screwed. No, the bound they quote is the one that you and I are thinking of, of 100, and, or 100 GV, so. I think they don't know how to do a log block. <laughs> yeah, they're worried about, you know, teraflops on their lead. They got a little uh, carried away here. Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> I think that is exactly what they did. Uh, so this is a motivation, one motivation. So here's our picture again. These guys are sort of the signature we would have at the LHC of what's going on here. So while that's the motivation, nothing I'm going to say for the rest of the talk cares about these baryons. At the LHC, I care about the lightest states that I'm going to make. And that's going to be these pseudoscalars, the dark pions, and any vector mesons that I've got. Right? So if you, don't li if you like the dark matter motivation, stick with it. It is going to uh, make a difference about some other choices I'll have to make going forward. But if you don't care, you could just say, purely from a phenomenological aspect, how would you go look for these things at the LHC? It's just a possibility for states that could be there. Let's go study what our, uh, how well, how we'll, how we look for them. All right. So now we've gotten sort of motivated and understand uh, the framework I'm talking about. There's a couple of choices we can make. I said I want my dark fermions. They're charged under our electroweak group, but I haven't told you how I charge them. And there's a couple of choices that you could make. One hangs out in this corner is where I give them vector-like charges, meaning charge the left-handed and the right-handed dark fermion under the same representation of SU2. That was called vector-like confinement. That was figured out by a bunch of, or played with by a bunch of people uh, 10 or so years ago. There's also sort of an opposite corner in terms of coupling space where I couple things chirally. Left and right dark fermion have different electroweak charges. That's just what I mean by chirally. If you do this, this uh, Marcus has studied, along with some other people, not necessarily in the dark matter context, but just in possibility for connecting to electroweak symmetry breaking, et cetera, uh, under the name of bosonic technicolor or induced in electroweak symmetry breaking. I don't want to do either of these camps. I want to sit smack in the middle. Sort of gets to Francesco's question. I want to have things that have both vector-like characteristics and some chiral characteristics. So here's an example model, talking microscopic here. This is in terms of what, how the dark fermions are, what their charges are. Right? You can basically ignore this guy. This just says they do have this new color group. Uh, here's an example where I mean vector-like charges. Left and right of this psi fermion are both doublets. Left and right of this chi fermion have the same hypercharge. So I can write, because left and right are the same assignments, a vector mass for these fermions. And I can write a vector mass for these assignments. But because I put in some doublets and some singlets, I can also write a Yukao interaction between my various kinds. So I have a mix. This is what I mean by the mix. Vector-like and also a chiral mass. Chiral, give the Higgs a VEV. This turns onto a mass that sort of marries these two guys together. So this is a mix, vector, and chiral. I don't pick this choice just because it's interesting. This was also shown to be one of those cases studied where your lightest I call it, and this a slip of the tongue here, dark baryon. I let in my uh, old language, the techni baryon. So these choices of charges here would give you a lightest neutral baryon, which is not obvious, right? but people, these guys worked this out. OK, so that's sort of the UV. Yes? Uh, that's what the dot, dot, dot's there. I'm lazy. Yeah, this by itself would not cancel anomalies. I would have to put in more matter. You're absolutely right. So that's our UV picture in terms of the you know, microscopic degrees of freedom. Once I go below the scale of where all these things can find, uh, I can describe this using a nonlinear sigma model. So I'm implicitly assuming here that those masses are small compared to the scale where strong dynamics kicks in. For these charge assignments, you want this to be an even number. So SU4 will work with these charge assignments. 
Very good question. Almost, but yes. I'll say one more thing about QED that. QED should lift up the guys with charges, right? So with this assignment, you can show the lightest state will be the spin zero, zero charge, zero electroweak charge. Yes. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's a barrier. I'm imagining this is an even number, though so not totally crucial. It's not a composite Higgs, right? I mean, there is some kind of bit of language like this. It's totally vectorial under the SU2, so I can write that's a math term. But what's the charge under SU2? I want to be able to talk to it, right? Yeah, essentially. I mean, originally these models were motivated by Technicolor, where then, yes, <laughs> you had to do that. But now this is sort of saying, let's forget the Technicolor motivation, charge things vectorially. You don't have the... You know, dirty aspects of Technicolor, but you can still then communicate with this new composite sector. So we have our, this is our sort of, in terms of the composite degrees of freedom, yeah, we're going to have, this is a mass matrix, and there's also going to be another matrix which encodes how the different fermions talk to the Higgs. Uh, not super important. Different fermion components, you can just sort of imagine stapling these things together, they're going to give you different bound states with different standard model charges and different masses, which you can work out directly from their Lagrangian we wrote down. So we could take a field like this, those size, which were the doublets. If I make this sort of interpolating field for the pion, one of these pions, it's going to be an electroweak triplet, and I can crank out its mass. On the other hand, if I make it out of those singlets, I'm going to have a singlet, and this is its mass. And I can mix and match these, and I could go dot, dot, dot if I put in additional, more exotic sort of charges. So why do I say this? Is that I want to then be able to play with the order of uh, how big this mass is compared to this, compared to this. As I change those parameters, I'm going to change which of these multiplets is the lightest pion, and therefore the most relevant from phenomenology. So that's sort of just what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of slides. We'd also expect vectors where I would just put in a gamma mu to similar fermion content. All right, why would I do this? Why do I want to have this mix match of chiral plus vector light? One reason is because it allows the dark pions to decay. If I hadn't put in that Higgs-like interaction, there's an accidental flavor symmetry which would forbid the pions from decaying. This is not terrible, it's just not the theory I'm doing. So I want them to decay. So I'm going to put this in, you can sort of see how this works, either in a composite picture or in terms of the actual degrees of freedom, stapling in Higgs, Vevs, and masses. Um, this vector-like theories that I mentioned that uh, Killick and Thunderum, et cetera, studied, they had to get around this by sort of standing on their head, adding in new operators. This just does it automatically. And again, if you want the pion to be the dark matter, Yang is the expert on that, or an expert on that. Another reason, if I had those vector-like masses, I'm not getting all of the mass for those pions from electroweak symmetry break. If I go back to this picture and I erase these Ms, which is only possible if I have vector-like charges, everybody's mass is Y times V. If that's the case, I can't take Y very small because this is an electroweak triplet. It can't be super light. But because... The pion is still parity odd. In this setup? Uh, yeah, I just saw one diagram where you mix with Higgs. Is that right? Yeah, that's probably a crappy diagram. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, it's still a different quantum number of particles. So, yeah. hand waving picture. Thank you. Uh, since I have that other source of mass, the vector like m, I can take y to be very small. Why is that important? Because you know, as soon as I say new stuff with electroweak charge, the audience yells at you and says S parameter, as they should. You can write down the S parameter sort of uh, diagram and show that this S in one of these theories is going to go like Y times V. So I could take Y very, very small, something 10 to the minus 3, 5, whatever your favorite super small number is. This is going to be totally not an issue then, because this is not its only source of mass. Also, I now have, because I've introduced the Higgs in this theory, technically our dark baryons can talk to a Higgs. But if I make Y very small, those are negligible interactions. Another reason is that this is very rich, relatively unexplored 
or not unexplored, but unique phenomenology, which is what I'll focus on sort of in the last part, later part of the talk. Uh, these are some diagrams we'll visit in a second. Looking at these actually exposes some holes and some biases in searches, which is what I'm mostly interested in, saying that, yes, we get these plots which are showing all the lines of limits marching up to higher and higher masses. But there are some biases built in those, and this kind of scenario is one that really pinpoints some of those biases. So even if you don't care about dark matter, this is pointing out states that could exist that current searches don't do a very good job constraining. So that's why I want to study these theories. There is one more thing that I actually want to do. Just as the story I've told you, I could, uh, yes, I've already argued that there could be some electroweak triplets made from fundamental doublet fermions. If there's an electroweak triplet around, I could imagine just writing down in an operator of this form. Higgs dagger, or Higgs TA Higgs, and here's my triplet pion. As soon as I plug in VEVs for the Higgs, this is gonna generate a VEV for the pion, which will be a contribution to the T parameter. This is a custodial symmetry violating thing. Not horrible, but I can get rid of it completely if I, instead of assigning my fundamental fermions, charges under SU2 times U1, if I enlarge that and I assign them charges under SU2 times a full SU2. So this is the global custodial symmetry of the Higgs. So instead of saying some of my fermions have SU2 times U1 charges, I want to give them SU2 left and SU2 right charges. And hypercharge is the T3 part of SU2 right. So by insisting on custodial symmetry, that's going to erase this diagram. More on why I would want to do that. Uh, under this custodial symmetry, if this is a group, the Higgs is now a bi-doublet. Right? This form, I can cram my normal quarks into a, the left-handed quarks are obviously transformed under the left, the right hand under the right. Here's an example. Looks like, again, looking at the microscopic theory, similar to what we had before, except instead of these being just Hypercharge, this is now enlarged into a full SU2. This is actually a, oh, right, and it's not that doing this shuts off this nice vector and chiral idea that I want to have. There are still vector-like masses that I can write down for this guy, same for this, and Yukawa couplings, too. This you could actually think about as being four flavors, right, because there's two guys here and two here. And the electric charge is sort of the T3 of this and the T3 of this. So you decompose this, you actually have two uptype quarks, or uptype dark fermions, and two downtype. But their masses are total, they have non-trivial mass matrices, but those mass matrices are identical, enforced by this custodial symmetry. All good? So here's our parameters, those are vector-like masses, and I have those various Yukawa couplings. So what I'm gonna be talking about, sort of when I'm showing plots about limits, is really two different scenarios. One where the SU2 left triplets are the lighter, meaning my bound state pions, and therefore rows are electric triplets, or reverse, where I make the SU2 right triplets lowest. Then these guys are gonna be electroweak singlets. This is just by playing with some of the masses that are vector-like masses. So I might refer, I'll refer to later SU2 left, SU2 right, that's is what I mean. In either case, I impose custodial symmetry, therefore I'm not gonna have that contribution to the T parameter. I'm not gonna have that two Higgs and a pi on operator. I am allowed to write operators like this. These are dimension five operators in an effective field theory. That's gonna lead to plug in a VEV for the Higgs, pi on decays to two quarks, so my pions can decay, which is good. I want them to, that was because I don't wanna have stable pions. Uh, I not only forbid that H, H, pi, I also forget, forbid H, D, H, D, pi, or various permutations of the derivatives. So this thing is really shut off. This is an actually interesting idea that's what we're exploring more, which is we're put in a sector that's really custodial symmetric, and it's only the custodial symmetry breaking of the standard model through, you know, Yukawa couplings that leak in. All right, this gets you a couple other benefits, or just interesting facts. One is that shutting this off removes, I said the pions can decay to quarks. This operator would allow the pion to, to decay to Higgs plus W. Just 
you know, this has got gold stones in it and there are Higgses in here. Uh, that is completely gone when I say custodial symmetric. It's not completely gone because I can write down even higher dimensional operators that would allow that. So most of the decays are two fermions. Custodial limit also shuts off the neutral decay or the decay through the anomaly into pions. Just imagine QCD if I took the mass of the up and down to be the same and them to have the same electric charge. That would shut off that anomaly loop. So these pions decay just like the charge pions decay. This also gets back to Antonio's question. This makes, this limit is not motivated just because we like custodial symmetry. It's actually required to make this real stealth scenario I said at the beginning. I said, yes, just polarizability, and nobody yelled at me, thank you. But there are other operators that I could have written down, namely the charge radius that would mess with this. So this limit also makes me very stealthy. All right, that's my model, or that's the model, that's the motivation. How do you see it? Well, there could be single production, make the pi on. At, we've already argued this coupling is very small, or I can take this freely very small, so that's negligible. Instead, we could also have making the vector meson. What's really going on, if you zoom in here, is you're making a WZ photon, and then in this blob here is actually a loop of those new quarks, which then you know, goes into a rho meson. So you can describe this completely analogous to rho photon vector meson dominance, this good old QCD. So what I'm imagining is that this blob here is that there's some kinetic mixing. That's what's the result of this blob that's either mixing a triplet of rows with the Ws, that would occur if the triplets are the lightest state, or a singlet row with hypercharge. And you could just estimate this NDA parameter, how big that kinetic mixing is. So these guys, we could singly produce. Now, as soon as you tell me I have a vector that I can make from standard model fermions, the first thing I'm gonna say is that there are incredibly strong limits making new vectors that can go into dileptons. So I would think as soon as you tell me I have new vector resonance, you're gonna be ruled out by rho to two leptons. Just a Z prime, where you call Z prime rho. This is not the case here. It's not the case here because there's another decay mode for that rho, possibly. If rho can decay to two pions, that is gonna be kinematically the favorable, or that's going to be the favorable way to go. In order for these quarks to decay to leptons, or to make a row and go to leptons, I have to go through this mixing twice. If I want to go to pions, I go through this mixing once to make the row, but then this is gonna be some strong coupling. G rho pi pi size thing. Just in QC, QCD, the row of QCD goes to two pions. It can go to two electrons, but it rarely does. Same physics. So, if we go ahead and turn the crank, this is actually what you would get for the branching ratio, right? The LL mode divided by into rows, so I'm approximating this is the total width. This is gonna be really small because I've got a whole bunch of pi squareds here. So if I take the bound that I had in the previous slide on rho going, or Z prime to two leptons, I interpreted it here, we can, this is this black line. So a heavier mass, I can get away with a larger branching ratio at the lepton. So everything above this black is ruled out. So and then I can draw constant lines of ND here, the number of dark colors, and see where they intersect this black. So for two colors, it doesn't intersect at all. It means two colors always goes to, two, to the pions, no limit. For four colors, the limit's way down here, 300 GeV or so. Even though there's a new electroweak interacting vector meson, because it always falls apart into two pions, looking into L plus L minus gets you essentially no limits. As I crank up the number of colors, yes, the limit gets stronger and stronger. I, in order to make this plot, I had to assume the pion was lighter than half the rho mass, so that's crucial for this. If I were to assume the pion is, <coughs> whoops, more than half the rho mass, I would get this black line then it can't go to two on-shell pions. I start to get strong bounds from vector meson to two leptons. So, summarizing what I've said over there, for small ND, the number of dark colors, the bound is significantly less than what you might naively expect. Even if the pion is only a little bit less than half the row. For lower pion mass relative to row, bound's completely gone, right? That's thinking down here. 
So we're not sort of benchmarks going forward. We'll consider a couple of different values here, and let's focus on this n equals 4 case. So we can't make single pions because they would have to go through that small Yukawa coupling. Single row, not really helpful. How do you see this? Pair produced the pions. Pions are produced essentially through Drellian. They're electroweak charge objects. But there's sort of this resonant piece. That's what this double line is there. That's the row. I could do this through a neutral meson. So this is a photon or Z, mixes through that kinetic mixing term, which you can think about just making these are you know, bound state techni row, dark row. This possibility, pi plus, pi minus, is there in either scenario. Either scenario meaning if the dark, lightest particles are SU2 triplets or singlets. If I want to have the analogous charge current channel, make a pi naught, pi plus minus, this only happens if this row is a triplet, right? Because a triplet has to mix with a triplet. This is making two on-shell pions. That's nice because now I don't care about the fact that that Yukawa coupling is very small. This is the production of this, either of these processes is just gonna be, I make the row, and then assuming the row goes 100% to pions, it's just branching ratio. So I never see that tiny Yukawa coupling I put in there. This is not magic. This is just small couplings you don't see in a branching ratio. So I have very few parameters here. It's really just how heavy these guys are compared to that row. Everything else is fixed by G and sort of NDA couplings. All right. Yes? So this is sort of yeah, hand waving, yeah, right? Right. So that would be valid if the, the, the prion, the dark prion, would be like narrow width approximation. Yeah, all this is absolutely in narrow width, right. Yeah, but the coupling involves are quite large. So coupling involves are, are, are quite large, but I've taken this ratio to be nearly a half, so they're sort of phase space suppressed. So neither of these are, they all are still valid for narrow width. But if I was to lower that, absolutely becomes, it starts to question this approximation. All right. Pair produced, how do the pions decay? As we sort of discussed, they have to decay, or almost all the time, decay to fermions, because that was the, their only route. The custodial symmetry shut off their other options. So this is just sort of what you expect. Charge ones decay to tau nu or TB. Neutral ones, BB or TT, depending on their mass. Uh, because all sort of fermions are light, there is a possibility of getting ZH in there. Thank you, I'm almost done here. What do we see? I have to pair produce something, it's electroweak strength, and they decay to things with no new source of missing energy. Electroweak strength, pair produced, no new missing energy. That is a recipe for very difficult territory for the LHC. Last couple of minutes, show how that works. Here are some examples of possible decays, or just production decays, just picking off. If they're light, these Pions they tend to go to taus or taus and bees. They're heavy, t's and b's, etc. We took this, we checked as many as me or the graduate students involved in the project uh, could check all LHC searches we could find, run this through, see where do limits come from. We found this is really hard. Most searches do not catch this. Why? Searches that involve taus are usually for staus. A stow, unlike our scenario, always has tons of missing energy. Not tons, but it has a new source of missing energy. The analysis here require lots of MET. Totally becomes inefficient for our scenario, which has no new source of missing energy. For T's and B's, there are plenty of searches, but they're always assuming some weird, weird in comparison to me, resonance structure, where either the tows are together, things that don't happen in my scenario. So again, because an existing analysis with these final states assume this, Results become inefficient. What does work? Just counting lots of leptons. So CMS and Atlas, at least at ATV, did searches where they just said, give me anything with three or more leptons. Uh, and then they sort of divide that further. Or sort of a subcategory of lots of leptons is same sign leptons. There's also very little background. Uh, unfortunately, CMS and Atlas do a same sign lepton search, as we'll see in plots in a second. We find that the ATV are actually more sensitive to thir than 13. Why? Because when they change the 13 TV, experimentalists, I don't know if they're going to yell at me, uh, Susie on the brain, they immediately start to put in a big cut in the 13 TV analysis, which 
is assuming a large amount of missing energy, which again, I don't have. So here are just some examples of how our model would get you, or this scenario would get you multiple leptons. Don't stare at this too much. The only thing I want you to take away is this is always coming from the charge current, pi plus, pi zero. It's very difficult to get a scenario with lots of leptons. If you take this, go back to our branching ratios, into pi plus, pi minus. Putting it all together, this is what limits that you get. Here are sort of the, some limits together are red. Those ATV, multi-lepton, and same sign, those are the leading most important things here. The 13 VEV stuff, smaller. This is for a specific assumption that the ratio of pi to rho mass is 45%. If I crank down that ratio, meaning hold the pi fixed, raise the rho, that was what was resonant in the cross section. If I do that, I effectively shrink the cross section, the bounds drop. So this is the same scenario. Both charge and neutral current pions possible, but ratio of only 25%. Bounds are dropped 200 GeV. 200 GeV stuff, new composite stuff. Totally fine, 200 GeV. If I go even crazier, oops, sorry. Yeah, that's just saying what I said. Uh, if I go even crazier and say I don't have that charge current because my lightest states happen to be electroweak singlets, bounds way down here. This is barely above the left bound. So you've got this whole sector of pions, rho mesons, that have electroweak quantum numbers, but because they are a little bit stealthy, and also because of the biases in the experiment, just not captured. So yes, bounds barely above left, despite we've got this huge machine. Not saying that this has been ignored on purpose, just saying, let's go make sure our LHC covers everything. So with that, I will forget that. Um, Forget, I'll just wrap up. What are the conclusions here? Weak scale strong dynamics is alive and well. Now Antonio talked about stuff for his thesis. This does echo back to some of the things I did in my thesis. So it is good to be able to say this. Uh, this was motivated by this stealthy scenario where I had these baryons that could be out there and LHC is the best way you're gonna see any hints of that sector, but it's also a more general statement. Mixed vector chiral avoids any issues with purely one of them. Custodial setups, nice. Uh, there's no issue with this rho, meaning it can just exist decaying into pions, uh, provided it kinematically allowed. Pair-produced pions sneak through most decays, as they have the things that I said, small production rates, their decays into third generation stuff, no BSM met, and some biases here. Limits are very weak. So, glad Rogerio entered. So if you haven't learned anything else, the one last thing I would tell you is be very careful opening Uber doors. It's the first thing I did arriving on Brazil was open the door into traffic. And if you're going to do this, make sure Rogerio is around to help you. <laughs> so thank you for everything. Thank you very much, Rogerio. Thanks to all of you. So. And questions? Questions? And uh, I'm trying to understand the symmetry breaking pattern. So I, I, I was confused. Uh, how, how do you know that the pion, these pions don't contribute to the, don't mix with the Higgs Goldstone boson? And then, oh, because they also, after condensate, they will also contribute to the VEV, to the electric VEV? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. There is a small contribution to electric symmetry breaking coming from this composite sector. But you are able to control this because it's all proportional to that coupling Y. So since I'm allowed to take that small, I can dial down that contribution to electroweak symmetry breaking from not standard model Higgs as small as I want. But yeah, you're absolutely so, right. What, the, uh, can, you, can you explain the... So we've got this, new fermions, because right once this gets a vacuum expectation value, right, this is going to, this condensate that I get here will contribute to electroweak symmetry breaking, but it's all proportional to that. And in my scenario, I'm taking this very, very, very small. So in a technicolor-like scenario, this would have to provide all of electroweak symmetry. Now I get the bulk of it from this, but a small amount from the strong dynamics. And in order to assure that you're getting the right vacuum, you do have to do a vacuum alignment it's, problem. Do you need some kind of consolation? Because the side side will condensate from the new strong dynamics. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, but, al you align the... Right, you do solve the vacuum alignment problem to make sure that in the absence of this interaction, 
it aligns in an electric weak preserving direction, right? That's okay. not obvious for this, but you have to do this calculation. Okay. Preskill and Peskin showed that the exact model that I've done there aligns you in an electric weak preserving direction until I start to perturb by something like that. But that's a very good question. Yeah, not obvious from the things that I said. Hi. Um, does this model also have bounds from displaced vertices? I know there's some LHCb uh, searches for dark pions in this. Very good question. Yes, again, so what I did there, assuming everything was prompt, then all the decays are secretly controlled by the same parameter. So there's a region where I can take this, where it's small enough that it doesn't screw up, as in the previous question, any electroweak physics, but the decays are still prompt. I am totally free to take this as a very tiny number if I want, and then display searches would come in. That's an interesting direction. I just haven't looked there at all. Uh, Adam, I understand that dileptin model is suppressed, but I would expect also diboson mode uh, of uh, rho decay. Does it be, I didn't, I didn't see mode of rho decay, right. The rho, because you can view this effectively as a mixing between the pions and the goldstones, right? That mixing is, again, proportional to small parameters. So unlike a technicolor model, there it's that they aren't always going to the Ws. They're only going to the Ws through a small mixing here. So rho will go to W and Z, but it's a small fraction of I see. the... So uh, you, you kind of neglect it. It's, it's similar to leptons, right? Even, even smaller. That's right. It's of the same size as leptons. Yeah, that's right. And then, it's then, not included in anything okay. I did. So your main signature is basically uh, digest two digest objects, essentially, yes. right? That, that's, that's right. That's your main signature. But they're not light digest, so they tend to have lots of bees and taus no, and I understand. things, right? It's so they're like kind of nasty. few yes. several hundred GV digest uh, pair. They all always come in pairs, right? Yes, that's right. I see. So, and there is no optimized searches for this, right? Can no. Not as far as I, know. I mean, maybe there secretly is. I would really like CMS or Atlas to repeat one of those multi-lepton, totally model-independent searches with 13 TB data, and I talk to my experimental colleagues and tell them this, but yeah, it hasn't been done yet, and there certainly isn't a dedicated Adam's crazy model search. But, but, but it, when you have a pions, well, this heavy pions decaying to digest, they also can decay to dileptons in principle, right? Uh, they can decay, since we're saying decays go through, um, yeah, standard model cows, they decay to taus. Ah, so they, all right, okay, yeah. so it's Yukawa driven, okay. Yeah, that's right. Then probably Titibar or Bibibar will be the, the, the main kind of. Depends on the mass of the pions, but yeah, okay. that was sort of our main signal. But Titibar with electroweak strength production is going to get swamped by lots of QCD background. So it's hard. Yeah. Are there any uh, cosmological constraints coming from, uh, so the, the nature of the phase transition uh, in this Wonderful dark Wonderful question. I know some of uh, those lattice guys are studied, starting to think about that. I think it's a cool question. I haven't thought about it. It might not yet. be a crossover. Like, yeah, it like might be a little bit uh, strange. You're absolutely right. Get some uh, super cooling or something. Mm. So the LSD guys didn't study the they nature of the phase They are currently transition now, model. but they are with now, a little okay. sort of a lattice angle, I just right. think it's an cool. interesting question, but hasn't been explored Thanks. yet. I think. Uh, Pedro Schwaller and collaborators may have explored something, maybe not an identical model, but enough of the same moving parts. Yeah. So it may be looked at, but I and honestly don't remember. Like I don't honestly remember their conclusions. Further questions? Oops. No? So let's thank this speaker again.